All right, it's good to see you. I'd like for you to take your Bibles and turn to the Revelation. The Revelation. This has been such a blessing to me. I just, I just want you to know it's been such a blessing to me to study and to glean and to seek by God's grace, not to read into the context, but to, to get out of it what God has put there and maybe some things that sometimes we just jet right on over. Don't like that like I don't like the fly that's buzzing around my head right now, but that's okay. All right, so let's go ahead and pray, and we will get into the church at Smyrna. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless tonight as we look into your word. I ask God that you'd open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Lord, teach us. We are a local church, just like Smyrna, just like Ephesus, just like these others. And being a local church, we, we carry the trials and the temptations and the difficulties of a local church. We seek to do your will. We seek to live by thy grace. We are individuals in a local church that desire to fulfill your will as you taught us to pray, like we mentioned this morning in the Sermon on the Mount. So we are here. Your spirit is here. We once again come in a spirit of worship, and we ask that you would open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. Let's take our Bibles again, going to Revelation 2. We have looked at the church at Ephesus. Thou hast left thy first love, it said, and we've gotten into that. And that is something that we need to take note of. We need to, by God's grace, say, no, I want to keep that fresh. Now we come to one of two churches that are unique in the list of the seven churches. Because these two churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, do not have situations pointed out by Christ that he doesn't like. They're, he's not pointing out sin. He's not pointing out apostasy. Instead, there are unique situations in this particular situation in Smyrna that speaks volumes to us. That's why it was so exciting to look at. So verse 8, we will begin there. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Now here, we don't want to read so much into it that we start to get away from a literal interpretation and also just what the Lord is trying to teach us, but there are some things about this and what we are starting to get more and more into when it comes to our current cultural situation, not only in America, but around the world, and just glean some things that it's like, okay, I see why the Lord said certain things here and how I can be encouraged by it. Let me show you what I mean. I want to get that a little clearer. When it comes to the city of Ephesus, it was, excuse me, Smyrna, forgive me. 
it was located some 35 miles north of Ephesus. Uh, Roger, I think this, uh, this last Wednesday, you showed a map, and that was, all, that was all on there. The population in John's day was over 100,000. But what's interesting is this is the only time the church at Smyrna is mentioned in the Bible. Smyrna itself was destroyed by a massive earthquake just several years before the birth of Christ, but it was rebuilt and rebuilt greatly. It possessed a safe harbor. They were proud of their city. It looked like around the city itself, the mountains formed a crown. They called themselves, when the ch city chose a motto to put it on their coinage, they put first in Asia in size and beauty. It was famous for myrrh. That, of course, was used not only as something, as a fragrance for the living, but also for embalming for the dead. Smyrna was a planned city. Now, I, you know, I think of us and I think of how we'll lay out a city when it comes sometimes to the geography and also when people have a desire to just make transportation in a city better. That was the situation with Smyrna, down to the last detail, especially when it came to the many temples that they had, to the idols that they worshipped, many of them including Zeus, Apollo, and Aphrodite. In fact, there was literally a street of gold that came out in one direction out of the temple of Zeus. So it was a beautiful city. It was a thriving city when it came to the Jews. They were very content there, and we'll see about them in just a moment. It was also a free city. Now understand, I want you to listen carefully what I'm going to be talking about here. They were a free city because they were loyal to Rome in a great way. They worshipped Rome and sided with Rome in every situation, every situation, be it war, conflict, you name it. In 196 BC, Smyrna erected a temple to the goddess of Rome. Now, now we can start thinking when it comes to loyalties and sometimes loyalties that are forced on people or that they are talked into, just think about this. A century later, after they did this to the goddess of Rome, there was a general, his name was Sulla. His army was not prepared when it came to clothing for the coming winter. The citizens of Smyrna were so loyal, they literally took the clothing that they had and they gave it to that army, plus they found every bit of clothing, that, excuse me, every bit of food they could find and sent it. For that reason, for their loyalty, they were declared a free city. They were not taxed, they were given a judicial center, and they were made a prominent city in the empire of Rome. So they were, they were paid back well for their loyalty and their actions. It was a very political situation, but there was also a passion in their politics. At this time, building up more and more, there was emperor worship that was starting to be utilized and encouraged. Emperor worship. It went from voluntary to mandatory, in fact, under Emperor Domitian. And this is what took place. Once a year, once a year, the citizens of Rome, a Roman citizen, 
had to burn a pinch of incense on the altar of Caesar and say this, Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. Once a year. And in fact, when they did that, they got a certificate saying that they did. You know, kind of like a little card that signed off. Think of situations. Now just, just for what it's worth. Again, not trying to read into this. But history tells us a whole lot about the future. And the Bible tells us a whole lot about the future. So think of situations when compliance to a movement or a requirement is pushed by cultural pressure. And they didn't even have Facebook. They didn't even have the internet. Or for that matter, they didn't have television. You know, whatever it might be. Now, in the middle of all this, there was a Christian uh, community. In that community, they were under intense pressure. Now, again, we're, we're looking at this and we're thinking us and current situations and our God. All right? Now, before, what we heard from Christ when it came to that church is, hey, you've left your first love. With this church, what we're seeing, some, what we're going to see is the heart of our Savior when it comes to his own in situations like this and like this. Because there are believers that get worried. They wind up becoming concerned. And, and I can understand that. We all can understand that. What's going to happen? You know, what, what's, what's, going to, what's going to take place? I'm still floored by what I read when it comes to what's going on in, Can in Canada or what I hear. And it's the same thing in Western Europe. And it's like, is, is, what's, what's the problem here? What's the difficulty? Don't you all have the freedoms we have? Well, the fact of the matter is they don't. There are subtleties that we have, praise God, because of our Constitution. But again, those can be ignored. What takes place here is the Lord comes to them with comfort, telling them, listen, before the world, you are deemed as weak and poor. But I want you to listen to what I have to say on this. Now, there are those that argue that this doesn't take place, that this isn't, you know, this is reading into it. And I can understand that, but I think there is something to be said here. When it comes to speaking prophetically, this church pictures... I believe the persecution that was inflicted on believers by Roman emperors, emperors, excuse me, basically between the year 100 AD and 312 AD. But whatever it might be, when it comes to what the scripture tells us, we understand this. There is a word here for everyone who has ever or will ever suffer for Jesus sake. Did you hear what I said? We do not become orphans when things become a challenge. We do not do that. It is believed that Paul organized this church. It's believed that he organized this church on his third missionary journey. History tells us this that there was a man by the name of Polycarp who pastored this church. And there is record of something that took place with him, but I'll talk about that later. So first of all, let's go back to verse 8 if we can. 
Unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith, I love this, the first and the last which was dead and is alive. Roger makes you want to sing, I serve a risen Savior. You know? Oh, by the way, the person that's speaking to you is the victory. Oh, man. That'll make you stand up and shout. He comes to this church and he says, I want you to understand I know some things. First of all, look at verse 9. The Lord says, I know your pressures. I know your pressures. He says this, I know thy works. Now, we've been there already with Ephesus, right? I know thy works. You've done this, you've done this, but you've left your first love. We don't get that here in Smyrna. But what's joyful is to understand this. He says, I know thy works. I also know something else. I know your persecution. I know, excuse me, your, your tribulation. That word tribulation literally means pressure. It was used, that word, they would understand that. That word is the word that they would use when it came to taking the myrrh and crushing it in a situation with stone and such to break it open to be able to use it. They knew that word. And they knew that Christ knew. You know, right now, we are here in America and rejoice, by the way, for what we have. But we also understand this, and I know this list includes people that, that name the name of Christ somehow, but they have a works religion. I understand that. But according to a particular group, and I'll explain it later who they are, every day, every day in the world, 13 Christians worldwide are killed because of their faith. Every day, every day, on average, 12 churches or Christian buildings are attacked every day. Every day, 12 Christians are unjustly arrested or imprisoned, and another five are abducted. I'm not going to say what I think the country might be because I believe that they're wanting to keep it uh, somewhat quiet, but I think when I say it, you might understand what country it is. But there is a, a brother that I know that used to be a pastor, a good man, he works uh, with churches in the 1040 window. Last night, or night before last, he got an email, and he sent out a thing said, please pray. I got an email from one of our pastors in a large communist country. And the, Christ, the, the pastor said this, please pray. In the last two days, we have been visited by the police twice. We just now got a call. We need to go down to the police station the next morning. This is what's taking place. This report that I've been quoting from is from the 2021 World Watch List by the group called Open Doors. They reported on the top 50 countries where Christians are most persecuted for following Jesus. According to them, approximately 215 million, excuse me, 215 million Christians experience high, very high, or extreme persecution. North Korea remains the most dangerous place to be a Christian, and they have held that slot for 14 years. Overall, Islamic extremism remains the global dominant driver of persecution. Islamic extremism, responsible for initiating oppression 
and conflict in 35 out of the 50 countries on the 2017 list. So consider with that the challenges our nation has and what we might have in places here in America and in our government because of the onslaught of Islamic pressure that is found in our state capitals, our nation, our national capital, and even in our school system. It's just something to take note of. When it comes to a particular country, China is act actively suppressing the free expression of more than 97 million Christians in the country. It ranks number 17 on the Open Doors 2021 World Watch list. Houses of worship are under increased scrutiny by the Chinese Communist Party, and police regularly raid the homes of those leading and attending online church meetings, driving many to escape the country. And we think about the missionaries that we would have there. But I also think about the American worker that is over there. You know, what is the future going to hold? Well, praise God, like we've said before, we know who holds the future. But one thing I find that is concerning is through social media, the Chinese Communist Party is exerting pressure on institutions, including Christian institutions, around the world, including America. They are manipulating Hollywood, and they are manipulating organizations, banks, and so forth. And you know, it's just interesting what's happening with the world. That brings us to the next point. Christ tells the people in Smyrna, the Christians, I also know your opponents. Look at the verse again. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Remember, the Jew saw the idea of father as not something necessarily as a physical, you know, one to the other to the other. There was also, there was also the idea of who you were listening to. Remember what Jesus said to the uh, Sadducees and the Pharisees? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. Well, here is the, situa the same thing. The Jews, what was taking place, the Jews in Smyrna were joining hands with idolaters in Smyrna to persecute the Christian minority. Now, with that, you've got to stop and consider. What is it that you do to make people hate Christians? Well, many things what you do is this. You lie. You lie. You misrepresent. You falsify. It's just like what I mentioned this morning about the churches in Canada. It was amazing that they came and arrested this pastor even though in a few days they're opening up Alberta. Completely opened up. And yet, they are not going to stand for somebody to prove them wrong when it comes to these things backing down, when it comes to the virus, and we're safe, we're practicing social distancing and all this. This is what they would say. According to historical record, number one, the Jews and the pagans accused the Christians of cannibalism. Cannibalism. Why? The Lord's Supper. This is the body and this is the blood of Christ. And they said, see, you know, this is your passion, what you're going after. They represent, they do not become the, the body and the blood. I'm sorry, the Catholic Church is dropped dead wrong. The pagans also accused the Christians of engaging in 
orgies. What the Christians would do is they would gather in what they called agape feasts, love feasts. They were nothing more than times of fellowship where believers enjoyed one another's company. There was nothing going on. You know, I've learned this. People who have a bent in their heart for a particular sin will accuse other people of doing that very same thing. And sometimes it comes out in a big way down the road. That's all I'll say about that. It's the same thing with these people. Because of their sinful state, they accuse the Christians of doing uh, the same thing because quite honestly, that's what they would do in a particular situation like this. Also, the Christians were hated because of their, that their beliefs and their practices often split families. The Lord said, honestly, that was going to happen. Matthew 10, 34, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I'm not come to send peace but a sword. This is what's going to happen. I'm come to set a man at variance against his father and daughter, against her mother and the daughter-in-law, against her mother-in-law, and a man's foe shall be of his own household. Sometimes it took place like that. We learned a long time ago when dealing with the people in India with P.D. Cherian and those that we support over there in India, if you became a Christian in India, they would actually have, and it could be that this takes place in other countries, but they would actually have a funeral. They would declare you dead to the family. This situation too. Christians were accused of being atheists because they did not worship the gods of Smyrna. Now, does America have gods? Are we going to worship them? No. We're not going to worship. I, I still am amazed when I stop and I consider, I almost put it in my notes, but, I, uh, but I'll just mention it briefly, where there is a congressman from uh, Michigan that back in 2015 made the statement, it's right there, you can read it, it's in the record, where he made the statement that people come to government to feed their souls. I'm sorry, I go to Jesus to feed my soul. I don't go to Uncle Sam, I go to Jesus Christ. Uncle Sam is broke. Jesus Christ has everything. And then lastly, Christians were accused of being political enemies. Why? Because they would not say, Caesar is Lord. Now, I don't know how that might play out in the future, but mankind right now under socialism, mankind is declaring more and more that what they have is the answer and who they are is the answer, and they are the ones that you swear allegiance to. They are God, not the God of heaven. That's why they have done everything that they can to get rid of the God of heaven through evolution. Praise God, we know better, we know different. And then he says this, look again to verse 9. I've said, I, I know your opponents, but I know your poverty. Now watch this. He says, and poverty, and then in parenthesis, but thou art rich. Now, now, now listen, we don't have much when it comes to this world's goods. We don't need it. Our record and what we own is in heaven. The word that is used for poverty, poverty there, it's the one that speaks of being absolutely destitute. Here they were in Smyrna. They were denied jobs because of what they believed. They were denied jobs. 
If they had a job, they were denied promotions simply because of their testimony. And so you have, so you have people in America that are denied jobs and denied promotions because of a stance that they would take, for instance, on the homosexual issue, on the transsexual issue. They're fired, they're kicked out, they're maligned, all kinds of things. It's taking place here. Not as big a scale as Smyrna, but it's going that direction. It's going that direction. Imagine how Satan must have looked at these people and mocked. But Christ said they were rich. Hold that thought. Now look at verse 10. I know your opponents, I know your poverty, I know your persecutions. Verse 10, fear, not, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Now, there's been speculation. What does the ten days mean? Well, in those years that I gave you, 100 to 312 A.D., there were ten major persecutions. Other people have said, well, the ten days means something that's very short. Whatever, you know, you look, you desire God's, excuse me, God's wisdom, the, the, the guidance of his Holy Spirit. But to me, what we need to recognize is this. Here we are, we're in a situation where we have not faced persecution like not only people in the past, but also people in the present in other places around the world. Now we're looking at the potential of it. What is our view? I'll tell you this. Our view needs to grow. Our view needs to mature. What I mean by that is this. What at one time we thought was not a possibility is now a possibility. It's growing at least. And we need to recognize that here in the and the, the account of Christ coming to Smyrna, that we will recognize that Christ walks with us. He goes with us. According to church history, and again, this is a long time ago. Some people might, you know, debate, okay, how how accurate is this? I don't know. But remember, these people were used to taking and keeping record. It was the year 155 AD. Polycarp was the pastor, the bishop of Smyrna. He was a disciple of John. And remember, John lived a long time. And it's possible that John was a pastor here at time as well. He was arrested at the request of an angry mob. Now remember, Christians were called out for being atheists because they would, not, they would not worship the gods of Smyrna, the gods of Rome. So the angry mob was crying out, away with the atheists. Let Polycarp be sought out. Polycarp was 86 years old at this time. They gave him an opportunity to renounce Jesus. The magistrate in this, in, in this situation, the magistrate apparently felt bad for the 86-year-old pastor. And he said to him, listen, what, what harm is there in saying, Lord Caesar. Polycarp said, no, I'm not going to do it. When they entered the stadium where the executions would take place, they tried again. Swear by the fortune of Caesar. Repent and say, away with the atheists. Polycarp, apparently, according to the history, 
stepped up and pointed to the crowd and said, away with the atheist. That didn't sit well. The magistrate again attempted to get Polycarp to renounce his faith. Swear and I will set you at liberty. I'll set you at liberty. Reproach Christ. And according to history, this is what Polycarp responded with. You can find this, by the way, in Fox's Book of Martyrs, along with other accounts. Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never did me an injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? They tried a few more times, and then that's it. He's going to be burned at the stake. They were about to nail him to the stake. And Polycarp said this, Leave me as I am. For he that giveth me strength to endure the fire will also enable me without your securing me by nails to remain without moving in the pile. They set it on fire and he stood there and burned to death for the cause of Christ. You know, we're told something by Paul as he spoke, and it was in what we were in 2 Timothy this morning. Paul told Timothy, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So here we've been, see? We're here, and we're seeing potential of what can take place. We're seeing the historical record of literally millions who have suffered for the cause of Christ. But what we have between us and them is a constitution, a bill of rights. And yet we're watching people shred that a little bit at a time. What is our response? To God be the glory. I don't mind doing what Paul did. Paul demanded his rights as a Roman citizen. You do not beat me uncondemned. A Roman citizen had the right to go through the law before he suffered for something that was done. They broke the law at times with Paul. Eventually, Caesar just had his head taken off. But he demanded his rights as a Roman citizen. I don't mind demanding my rights as an American, but I don't believe that those rights have the same power as the will of God. His will be done. His will be done. So, Christ comes and he says, after all this, please know my promises. Look at the latter part of verse 10. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now later on, we're going to talk about the crowns. We're not going to do that tonight. Look at verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Even though they were paying a price for their faith and their faithfulness and their service to the Lord. These people didn't look back. They're going forward. Now it's interesting what that verse says, him that overcometh. Question, who are the overcomers? Does this mean that, that okay, I've got a strain and, and boy, I, I, there's a standard I've got to keep? Who was it that wrote the revelation. John, the same person, wrote 
1 John. And listen to this from 1 John 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the overcomer. It's not the person that strained and moaned. And, you know, no, it's the one that says, Jesus is Lord. He is mine and I am his. Just, uh, just recently, I, I, for, for a while, and I'm not anymore, I was a member. I decided to join the uh, Ancestry.com thing again. And so our kids got a big kick out of that. But I found out that I'm not exactly who I thought I was. I was always looking to Ireland. Ugh, uh, the, the wearing of the green. Then I found out something else. I'm Scottish. And so our daughter Julie said, oh, I can't believe it. You know, my dad is Sean Connery. My, my, my mom is, is, is a Hitler Jew or a Hitler German. Hitler Jew, I can't believe I said that. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, and, you know, because I always said, you know, Brad is our resident German, but now my wife is there too. But I've enjoyed reading stories out of Scotland now, a little bit more. In Edinburgh, Scotland, there is a church called Greyfriars Kirk, or Greyfriars Kirk church. At the entrance to the church is a statue of a little terrier dog. The terrier dog is named Greyfriars Bobby. On the statue is inscribed, quote, a tribute to the affectionate fidelity of Greyfriars Bobby, unquote. In 1858, this faithful dog followed the remains of his master to Greyfriars Churchyard, where he was buried. For the next 14 years, day after day, rain, snow, whatever, this little dog went to his master's grave and he laid there 14 years. When the little dog died, he was buried in the church graveyard, just a few yards from his master's grave. Now, it's an interesting story. And people look at that and they see, they read about it, and the, the, the little thing that is there, you know, the little statue about the dog. But you know, there's something else that is there. And this kind of shows the attitude of the world and the fact that God's people are not going to be really honored here on earth. We will be honored by our God in heaven because nearby there, in the same place, there was something that took place back in the 1500s where Christians came together and they signed a covenant saying that they would not allow the king to place his preachers in the pulpits of the land. They were going to get the preachers that God appointed there. The king didn't like that. And so what took place? The result was persecution of Scottish believers. The real story is not about the dog. It's about in that same place, a little bit further, where there is a monument to the several thousand Christians that were either burned at the stake or hanged for their faith. 
They are all in a mass grave. The world looks and says, oh, what a cute dog. God's people understand that the real monument is way over there where our brothers and sisters lay and where they will be resurrected one day. You know, I am so glad our Lord is with us every step of the way. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. When Christ came to the church at Smyrna, he was identifying not only as their Lord, but also as one who had suffered just like them. Hebrews 4.15 For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Paul was, a, excuse me, Paul was directed by the Holy Spirit, taught by the Lord, to encourage us in the book of Romans this, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Romans 8, 37. 2 Corinthians 2.14 Now thanks be to God, unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. And in fact, it reminds us again, going further in Romans 8. Verse 31, What shall we say, then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I, I don't know what's going to take place. I really don't. I don't understand. And, and there's, there's more than national persecution that can take on. There can be local things. There can be situations with family. There can be situations with job. There can be all kinds of things. One way or another, Satan loves to threaten us. If you do not recant your faith, we're going to banish you. There were some people during the same time that it took place with Polycarp that said the same thing. If you do not recant your faith, we're going to banish you. Again, it was an older man that they were speaking to. The Christian said this, do what you will with me, because my Jesus said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. The magistrate then said, we'll take all your property and your possessions away from you. The saint said, you can't do that either. My treasures are laid up in heaven. Amen. Can't do it. No human hand can touch them. The magistrate said, if you do not renounce Jesus, we will put you to death. And the man said, you can't do that either. I've been dead with Jesus for 40 years. That'll fly. My life is hid with Christ in God, and you can't touch it. You can't touch it. Praise God. He knoweth the way that I take. As a Christian, and he knows the way that we take as a local church and as a body of believers in the year 2021. I don't relish anything that might be very difficult to go through, especially with family and such, and with the church family. But I believe we'll all find out that we have the very same God that the church in Smyrna had. Amen? Heavenly Father,